Hear me out there? Okay. Well, I'm going to pass around the attendance sheets. Uh, and last time we talked about sorting. Uh, lots of different sort methods, both general and specific for special cases, where sorting can be done faster. Um, uh, ended up with showing this uh, competition between sorts based on random data, nearly sorted data, different kinds of data, and how they um, fare against each other. Um, the n log n sorts tend to be the quadratic sorts, unless there's um, really bad data for the n log n sorts, in which case the quadratic sort may actually beat them on a smaller number of uh, inputs. And uh, today we're going to start talking about order statistics, which is kind of a subspecial case of sorting, where you want to find not necessarily just total order on the numbers, but specific items like the largest, the smallest, the medium, the ith largest, and other things. So if I say find the minimum in a bunch of numbers, obviously it can be done in linear time. But it's not trivial completely because uh, it's not obvious where the minimum is unless you do some work looking at all the items. If I ask you, what's the minimum of all these numbers? You know, it's not obvious when you first look at them. You have to actually do some work. And we'll get back to that. But finding the minimum problem is uh, you get a bunch of numbers like in an array and you find the minimum object or the minimum number. So obviously, um, well, it's not so obvious, but that uh, omega n linear time is necessary. It's also sufficient because you can quickly go through the numbers and find the minimum. But why is linear time also necessary? Well, you might say that each element has to be examined at least once. That's not quite a proof. It's an intuition. It's correct. But just saying that doesn't necessarily prove it. What you need to do is say a little bit more. Uh, so a more precise proof will say, assume towards that prediction that the minimum finding algorithm, whatever it may be, didn't look at one of the items and still gave out supposedly a correct answer. Well, that item that he didn't look at, call it x sub i, could have been minus a Google. And he would never have known that unless he looked at that x sub i, and x sub i is arbitrary. So whatever answer it reported, couldn't have been right in the general case. There's something in that x sub i place could have been smaller than it, whatever it reported as a minimum, so it couldn't have been correct in general. And that it refines the argument that everything must be looked at at least once during the execution of any algorithm for finding the minimum. How uh, many get that argument? Okay, it's pretty straightforward. It's a lower bound, and it's lower bound not just on a specific algorithm for finding the minimum, but on any possible algorithm for finding the minimum. This is a pretty easy lower bound. Lower bounds are generally hard to prove. In this case, we were lucky and it's easy to prove this one because the problem is so simple. Uh, but in general, you'll see that it's not easy to prove at all because you need to prove a non-existence proof. The lower bound means no algorithm in the universe, either that we know of or that we don't know of, or that even some omniscient entity we one day could come up with. None of those will work faster than that time. So you have to cover a lot of ground. You have to prove you're not a millionaire. It's hard to do in general. So it's a non-existence argument or proof. It's a form of proof like a prediction. 
So back to this. Still not clear where the minimum is unless I point it out to you. And there's minus a Google right there, which you may not have seen on the first pass until I, I pointed out that, that there it is. And if that one wasn't looked at, you would never have known the right answer. So you must, in general, look at everything. Okay. Uh, and often, a similar argument to what we just saw holds for many other problems. That every input data must be looked at. Of course, that gives you a linear lower bound. The linear lower bound is not that hard to come by, and it's not that um, you know, tricky to prove. Usually, it's a similar argument to this one. The trick is to prove better upper, better lower bounds than linear, like n log n or you know, quadratic or whatever. Okay. And generally, there's not a lot of lower bounds known in computer science or in mathematics in general. The linear ones are relatively easy to prove, just like we did here. But that's not saying much. I mean, you got to look at the input before you purport to you know, know the right answer. Uh, but beyond that, it's hard to prove. We already showed the nonlinear lower bound for something else. Anybody remember what it was? What problem did we show a nonlinear, a superlinear lower bound for? Sorted. And that was n log n. And the higher the lower bound, the harder it is to prove in general. And very few lower bounds are known in all computer science and math that are larger than n log n. For a few problems, there's quadratic lower bounds, but those are very few. And anything beyond that is extremely hard to prove because you've got to cover so much ground that it's hard to do it in general. Okay. So back to finding the minimum. Uh, so we show a lower bound. Let's show an upper bound. An upper bound is just some algorithm that works that meets that lower bound minimum. So very simple algorithm. It's basically a loop and an if statement. The item you're looking at is smaller than what you think is the minimum so far. You replace the minimum so far by that item and keep going. So it's a like king of the hill principle. With the current candidate for lower. So the minimum, and then you keep updating it if you see something lower than it. Okay. So the exact comparison count here is n minus 1, because you start with 2 in the loop and you keep going. So n minus 1 comparisons are sufficient. This is not an asymptotic bound. This is an exact bound. Right. n minus 1 comparisons are sufficient. Why? Because this one does the job. It works every time. It's correct, this, this piece of code, this algorithm. And so this gives you a theta of n time algorithm, because we already know the lower bound is linear. In fact, it's, it's n. The upper bound, uh, you know, the same as the lower bound. So this algorithm here is asymptotically optimal. Now, what if you want to find the maximum instead of the minimum? Do we have to repeat this whole argument about the lower bound, and then repeat some other piece of code? And, or is there some shortcut? Remember, sorting in ascending order and descending order is essentially identical. Why? Change the sign. You're going to flip the sign and then do the other thing, then flip them back, and then you'll have the answers. It's the same for minimum. If you want to find the maximum, flip the sign, find the minimum, get the result, but flip its sign, then you'll have the minimum. Right? If you want to find the maximum, you can find the minimum and use it to find the maximum. If you want to find the minimum to find the maximum, you have to find the minimum. So the two are equivalent, so we'll just worry about them finding the minimum, because finding the maximum is essentially equivalent. Okay. The trick is the question of whether we can do better than n minus 1. See, just because we had to look at all the data doesn't mean we had to do a linear number, you know, n, n comparisons total. Just because we had to look at n data pieces didn't mean we had to do n actual comparisons. You could have maybe done less comparisons. So first we'll show that n over 2 comparisons are necessary. Okay. So comparing the total running time is different than comparing the total number of comparisons. They're not necessarily the same thing. They're related. And the running time is at least as large as the number of comparisons, because you can't do more comparisons than you have time to do comparisons. But the thing is, if you say we must examine all the inputs, you know, compare each input at least to something else, you have to understand that, that one comparison can compare two things. Two elements can be compared using a single comparison. So to touch all the inputs with some comparison or another, all you need to do is n over two comparisons, because if you compare the inputs in pairs, then you look at each one, technically, but you only ex exhaust 
n over 2 comparisons. So that doesn't show anything larger than a lower bound for a comparison than n over 2. How many understand that? So you've got to do better than that if you want to show n minus 1 comparisons are necessary. Any questions so far? And now it gets more subtle. Okay. So just saying every input element must be looked at or compared to something else, that only gives you a lower bound of n over 2, not n, or not n minus 1. But it's not good enough. Okay. But it's still a non-existence proof for n over 2. So now we're going to refine this n over 2 lower bound to n minus 1. And this won't be as easy. Okay. So here's how we're going to do it. Um, to find the minimum, we're going to keep track of the knowledge, or the knowledge gained by doing comparisons, successive comparisons. Okay. So consider two classes, two broad classes of elements. First, all the elements, all the n elements, are in this unknown category. You know, it's, it's not a data structure, it's just a, a set of elements that originally, when before the algorithm starts, all the items are in this unknown category because we don't know if any of them is the minimum or the maximum or any other thing. They're unknown. And at the end, we'll know that Almost all of them are not the minimum except one. Okay? So if you take two elements from the unknown category and compare them, you will know something about one or the other based on that comparison. And by the way, we're assuming all the elements are unique. Why is it safe to make that assumption? Why can we make the assumption that all the elements are unique without loss of generality? So every two items are either more greater than strictly greater than or strictly less than one, one or the other but they're never equal. What allows us to make this assumption of uniqueness without losing any generality about the entire discussion. Yeah. If you have duplicates, then it doesn't affect the minimum format. Yeah, if you have duplicates, it doesn't affect. And even if you have duplicates, more generally, you can make them non-duplicates by breaking ties based on the index in the array where the duplicates came from. Just like in sorting. Right? Remember sorting? Just worried about unique elements, it made, made it easier because you just have to worry about less than the greater than not the third case, that makes the analysis easier, the algorithm easier. Okay, same thing here, so assume they're all unique. Okay, so the initial state is n things unknown and zero things known to be the minimum or not the minimum. So this category here, the green, will be all the elements that have won against some other element in terms of comparison that were greater than something else. They beat something else in terms of size, so they won a comparison. And if something won a comparison against something else, it can't be the minimum, so I'm denoting it also as min with a line crossing through it, saying it's not the minimum. So at the beginning, n elements are unknown, and zero are known to be not the minimum. Okay, zero are known to be have won against something else, because we haven't done any comparison. The algorithm didn't start running yet. Which algorithm did we start running yet? Who's measuring an algorithm here? Which one? Is it the algorithm from the previous slide? Let's say an algorithm compares. Is it is it this algorithm here? Remember, we're we're, we're proving a lower bound on the problem of finding the minimum. So when I say an algorithm that starts with the state of n things being unknown and zero things being known to be the minimum. Which algorithm am I talking about now? It's not a trick question. It's a very simple question. We're proving a lower bound on the problem. Which algorithm are we referring to in this slide? Just to make sure you understand where we're going. One word. Which algorithm? Starts with an A. With a binary vowel? Oh, you could start with an E. I mean, it's not a unique word. Any algorithm. Why any algorithm? Why not some specific algorithm? Because I'm showing a lower bound than the problem. I'm not talking about the running time of any particular algorithm. I want to show how hard the problem is in general for any algorithm, any conceivable algorithm. Okay, every, how many understand that? Okay, so, so why don't you say something? Here? Okay, let's move on. Uh, so at the end, the final state of knowledge would be that one thing we 
uh, uh, remain unknown and and n minus one things will remain not the minimum will already be known to be not the minimum. In other words, they would have won a comparison against something else. And so at the end, the state of the knowledge will be this, and this remaining one item in this category, this category of item that uh, uh, didn't, that didn't uh, win against something else, that must have been the minimum of all the items. Again, because it's unique. There's only one item here that didn't win. All these items won against something, and because they won, they're not the minimum. This must be the minimum. So this is a representation of the state of any algorithm, the knowledge gained by any algorithm. I'm not saying anything about how the algorithm works or doesn't work or what data structure it uses or what language it's written in or what computer it's running on or you know, which omniscient deity invented it or anything like that. This applies to any of them, to all of them. Okay. So any algorithm needs to get us from this state to that state. And now we'll see the minimum number of steps necessary to get from here to here. So if you take two things from the unknown category, x and y, let's do it properly. So you take x and y and you compare them and they compare like this. Let's say x is ending up less, being less than y. Again, because it's unique, we don't have to worry about the third case when they're equal. So x is less than y. And they're both unknown to begin with in terms of their minimumness of the entire input set. What can you tell me about x and what can you tell me about y at this point? x was less than y. Can y be the minimum? No. Can x be the minimum? It could. It doesn't have to be, but maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But y, for sure, we know it's not the minimum. So these two elements get reshuffled this way now after the comparison. x remains unknown because we don't know. We didn't win against anything yet. y won against something, so for sure it can't be the minimum. And that comparison gained us this little bit of knowledge. Okay. And if you take two elements from this set, the green set, the ones that are already worn, and you compare them, say y against z, and the comparison ends up being like this, what does that tell us about y and z with respect to the potential of being the minimum or being the one of them? Nothing. Nothing. But we could, in particular, because we already knew they're not the minimum because both of them are came from this green set that they both have already won in previous comparison against something else. So we already knew that they're not the minimum. So comparing them to each other is not going to gain us any more knowledge than that because we already for sure know that they're not the minimum. So in fact, we just wasted a comparison. Just because we did a comparison doesn't mean it's a useful comparison. Nothing stops you from doing a non-useful or not necessary compa comparison while you're running an algorithm. How many understand that? You can do it to your heart's content. You're just not making any progress. And that's okay. You can still do that. That's what it's nothing. The universe will not implode on itself if you just keep repeating the same comparison over and over. It's just not necessary. And here we're all about efficiency when it comes to algorithms. All right. So these two elements, after that comparison, still remain in that set. Neither one of them will ever migrate back to the blue set. No greens will ever migrate back to the blue. How I many can see that? Yeah. Because you already know something about it. Now, this, the other case is when you take a blue thing and compare it to a green thing, and it comes out like this. What do you know then? If this blue X compares less than this green Z, what can you tell me about the, the blue X and the green Z after the comparison? Which, which two sets, which sets should they be, migrate back to after the comparison? Same. Same. So the X, it's unknown. And if it's unknown, but it's less than z, it doesn't tell us it's the minimum. Maybe it's the minimum, maybe it isn't, so it's still unknown. The z, we already know it's in this set. It's not going to go back to the blue, so it's going to migrate backwards this way. So in fact, that was kind of a useless comparison, too, if that's the way they compare the x and the z. But what if the x and the z compare the other way? The x ends up being larger than the z. What can we know about the x now? Is it the minimum? Can it be the minimum? No, because it just beats something, so it can't be the minimum. The z can't be the minimum either, because that came from that set that already we knew not to be the minimum. So both migrate back to here, and we, again, made some progress to get us from this initial state to this final state. So basically, that's how the knowledge is tracked in the optimal most way, 
if you didn't waste any comparisons and you didn't make any blunders and recompare them when you didn't have to. Okay, so you notice that in each comparison, at most one element migrates from the blue set to the green set. And if you do unnecessary comparisons, that won't even be true. Not even one element, zero elements, will migrate and you will be spinning your wheels, not making any progress. And that's okay. The lower bound still holds because we get from this state here of n unknowns to one unknown, right? It must take you a minimum of how many different comparisons at the very least? n minus 1. Because each comparison migrates at most one element, empties this unknown set by at most one element at a time, not two. So to empty it all together from n to 1, you must make at least n minus 1 comparisons, no matter what the algorithm is. This logic here doesn't track an algorithm. It tracks the knowledge gained by any algorithm. The algorithm is not specific. So this conclusion is general to any algorithm whatsoever. It's a lower bound than any possible algorithm to find in the mean, and the lower bound is n minus 1 comparison. Which means the algorithm we had on a previous slide, a couple slides ago, that actually always terminated correctly with n minus 1 comparison, is optimal. Now you know. It's not just optimal in the running time, which is linear. It's optimal in the actual exact number of comparisons, which is n minus 1, precisely. Not just any linear, not 5n, not 3n, not 2n, but n minus 1, precisely. That's the lower bound. This algorithm now we know is optimal in two different ways. It's double optimal. It's optimal in the running time, which is big O of n. And it's optimal in the actual number of comparisons, n minus 1, precisely. And that's a good day when you can identify something as double optimal. Optimal in two things at the same time. It's rare enough to get an optimal in one thing or the other, but not necessarily in both. And notice that this lower bound, saying everything has to be compared at least once to something else, only gave us an n over 2 lower bound, not an n minus 1. The higher the lower bound, the better it is. The lower the upper bound, the better that is. How many get that? So you want to push upper bounds lower, and you want to push lower bounds higher. And when they meet, that's a very good day. In algorithmic design. And we just had that experience very nicely with relatively little work. Usually it's a lot more work than this. And notice how much more complicated the proof of n minus 1 is than the n over 2. n over 2 was just a simple observation that every comparison must touch two things, and because n things must be touched, n over 2 comparisons must be necessary. That's it. That's this proof here. Short, simple. This proof here was not simple. This proof here was subtle and involved with looking at a bunch of different cases and examining the total knowledge gained by any algorithm. And this is hard to come by, this kind of proof. The previous proof, you may be able to finagle in a few minutes of scratching your head. This one, you know, even days of scratching your head, you may not have this insight. Okay, but somebody did, and here it is. Well, any questions about this? How many understand what's going on? I don't see half the class raising their hand, so ask me questions. Yeah. So what did we exactly prove? Because we didn't get the minimum in the last slide, right? For sure. We did n by 2 comparisons. We got local minimums n by 2. But we didn't get an absolute minimum. Yeah. So he says we didn't get the absolute minimum. Think about it this way. This keeps track of the knowledge of any algorithm that uses comparisons to find the minimum like the algorithm from two slides ago, and any other algorithm. There's many, many algorithms to find the minimum, not just the two-liner from, from, from a couple of slides ago. That algorithm always finds the minimum, but that algorithm is always correct. So at the end, that algorithm will find the minimum. In this slide, we track the number of comparisons absolutely necessary for that algorithm to do its job. And it could take more than that, but this is the very least. And any algorithm that finds the minimum 
starts with not knowing anything about any of the inputs because he didn't look at them yet. He didn't start running yet. And that's this state here. And things are unknown. And nothing has won against nothing else because no comparisons were executed yet by that algorithm. That could be any algorithm whatsoever. And at the end, that algorithm must know for sure that one thing is the minimum. And all the other things are not the minimum. And how, he can, how can its algorithm know that? By comparing things. So it com every time it compares something, we're charging it one unit of cost, you know, a comparison. So as it keeps comparing things, we're observing that the number of unknown things about which the algorithm knows nothing can only diminish by at most one with every comparison. So the number of comparisons it needs to make is n minus 1. So is, that, is that OK? Yeah, I agree with this line. I didn't understand what we were trying to prove in the last. You said like n by 2 comparisons were necessary to. Yeah. So here we said n minus 2 comparisons are necessary. And that's correct. But it turns out that in addition to that, n minus 1 are also necessary. So to buy a car, one dollar is necessary, but it's not sufficient. You may need about 20,000 of those to buy the car. So one is a lower bound than the price of a car, one dollar. True statement. But $20,000 is a better lower bound than the price of a brand new, you know, reasonable car. That's also a true statement and doesn't contradict the first. Okay, it's a good question. I'm glad you asked it. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay, now we can go deeper into this stuff. I can see how it, how it goes. So, n minus 1 are necessary, n minus 1 are sufficient, and that's why the algorithm for visualize it is optimal. Right. What if you want to find the minimum and the maximum? Both. So, come up with an algorithm that finds the minimum and the maximum, and then we'll show a lower bound for that, and an upper bound. The upper bound will be much easier. The lower bound will be even harder than what, what you just saw. What you just saw is a pale you know, uh, version of what we're about to see. So we're building up to it. All right, so there's many ways to find the minimum and the maximum, just like there's infinite number of algorithms for any particular problem. And I just made a profound statement that may not be obvious. Why is there an infinite number of algorithms to solve any particular problem? An infinite number of codes or programs to solve any particular problem. And they're all different from one another. All these pieces of code are different. Can you always just add useless steps? You can always add useless steps, exactly. And the steps may not necessarily be all that useless. Some of them may contribute to the work, but not in a necessary way. How many understand that? It's subtle. It's not complicated, it's not, it's not you know, complicated, but it is subtle. So to add two numbers together, there's, there's not just millions of algorithms, there's an infinite number of algorithms to add two numbers together. Take the two numbers, play a lot of rounds of chess, and then spit out their sum. Well, that solves the addition problem. The chess part was not necessary. But nothing stops you from doing that, and the algorithm is still correct, still valid. It's just a lot less efficient than a much quicker algorithm without playing the chess in the middle. I'm not being facetious, I'm just making a point that you need to understand. So there's lots of algorithms for everything, and when we show lower bounds, we gotta cover them all. Just like when you try to prove you're not a millionaire, you gotta cover all bases, including you know, offshore accounts in the Cayman Islands, and including you know, lottery tickets in your drawers if you haven't cashed yet, and that, that would make you a millionaire, and on and on and on. And there's a lot of cases, an infinite number of possibilities. Okay, here's an obvious algorithm to find uh, uh, the min, but before that, if you want to find the max, you can just find the min of the negative of all the input. You know, that's to find the min and the max are the same. So to find the min and the max, what you can do is first find the min using the algorithm from before, and then find the max by finding the min of the negative of all these numbers using the algorithm from before. How many comparisons is that total? by doing it that way in two steps. Find the min and find the min of the negative, which is the max. 
twice what was that before. So it, precisely in terms of n is what? 2n minus 1. 2n minus, yeah, two. minus 2. Okay. Okay. So obviously, we're going to try to do better than that, because that's too simple. So n minus 1 to find the min, n minus 1 to find the max, total n minus n 2n minus 2. And notice that you're doing it independently. You're finding the min and doing all these comparisons. And when you find the max, you're doing a whole bunch of other comparisons and completely ignoring the first set of comparisons that you already did that may get you a lot of information that you're now discarding and ignoring. How many see that? Because you're doing it independently. And that's a shame. And it turns out that's not efficient. So now we'll try to do better than 2n minus 2, and that's where things get more subtle. So here's the new algorithm that works better than that, even. To find the min and the max. Here, here are the numbers in the array. These are the indices, the array x1, x2, x3. These are all different numbers. I'm just showing you the indices of the array. But I want to compare them in pairs. I'm going to compare the first two. And then one of them will be the minimum of those two, and one of them will be the maximum of those two, just those two. So the comparison of the first and the second element gives us a min and a max of the first two elements. And I'm going to save both of those, not discard them. And I'm going to compare all the others in pairs. Find the minimum of the first, of the number three and four, and then the other one will be the maximum of three and four, whichever the minimum is, the maximum of the other one. And I'm going to keep doing that. Find the min of all the pairs and the max of all the pairs. And how many comparisons does that take total to find all the mins of the pairs and the max of the adjacent pairs, just like that. How many comparisons total? And over two. over two, because right? I did them in pairs. Let's assume n is even. So that's over two comparisons. Now, the max of the entire set of the original array x is located where? In blue, in green, or unknown, or where? Where is the total max of everything? What do you have to look at at the very least? Or at best, only the green. The max can only come from these green candidates up here, not from the blues. The minimum can come only from these blues and not from the greens, which are the maxes. How many get that? So now we have a lot less candidates for the total min and the total max of the entire original set. So we then made a big shortcut. Right, so now you just got to take the min of all these guys in blue, and then you got to take the max of all these greens. And that'll give you the min and the max of the entire set. And that another n over 2 comparisons, because it's only n over 2 maxes candidates and only n over 2 min candidates. So now you can employ the algorithm from three slides ago that finds just the min in a set straightforwardly. Find the min of all those. It's n over 2 minus 1 right there. And finding the max is also n over 2 minus 1 comparisons. And at this point, you know the answer overall. And the total number of comparisons is n over 2 minus 1 plus n over 2 plus another n over 2 minus 1, which is 3n over 2 minus 2. And so 3 halves n comparisons, or 3n over 2 minus 2 precisely, comparisons are now necessary, uh, excuse me, are now sufficient to find the minimum and the maximum both. What we're about to show it, it's also necessary. That's the hard part, actually. But this is the easy part. The easy part is showing this algorithm. It's not obvious, but it's less obvious than the previous one. Find them in and separately find the max. This does them together, and thereby you save. How, what, percent, what percentage of the comparisons are saved by doing this more elaborate scheme than the previous scheme on the previous slide? How much, how much, how many comparisons did you take on the previous slide to do the straightforward find first the min separately, then find the max? And there you go. How many comparisons was that just for the record? Well, that was two n, two n minus two. This is three halves n minus two. So the savings from two to three and a half to three halves, two to one and a half, that's what? 24. 25% save. That, that, that could be substantial. You have you know, billions or trillions of things. Process. All right, any questions about this? This is an algorithm. This is not what we're about. I didn't, I'm not going to bother writing pseudocode, but the scheme is pretty straightforward. Often we, we won't write the code or pseudocode, but hopefully, if you, if you understand the scheme, you can write the code pretty straightforward from that. Well, if all you can do is code and don't know how to design algorithms, you know, 
you're in trouble. And this, this class is not about coding, it's about algorithm design. And these insights get you to efficiency and optimization in some interesting and possibly clever ways. And if you had to, you know, if you absolutely had to, you can sit down and write the code, sure. We're, we're assuming we all know how to code. Any questions about this? Because next, we're going to show that 3n over 2 comparisons are not just sufficient, they're also necessary. They're also a lower bound. That, that won't be so easy to show. Which means this algorithm is optimal two different ways. Once we show the lower bound, that n, 3n over 2 minus 2 are also sufficient, not just necessary. We show that both sufficient and necessary, then this algorithm which gives you three half n minus two comparisons, and that makes it sufficient, because it's also necessary. This algorithm is optimal two different ways. It's optimal in terms of running time, which is, this is obviously linear running time, by the way. How many understand that? It's linear time to run. But moreover, it's no worse than three half n minus two comparisons to run precisely, not big O, but exactly. So it's optimal two different ways, in running time and in the number of comparisons, both. So it's double optimal again like the previous one, the double optimal. All right, so we'll take a deep breath and I will show the lower bound on this. This won't even take on the slide. All right, so again, we're going to keep track of the knowledge gained. Yeah, question. But this has a linear context. It has linear? Space context. Space context. Oh, it has uh, linear time and linear space, yeah. But the number of comparisons um, is, is the best possible. Yeah, so, so you're right. We, we need a little bit of extra space to, uh, or maybe more than a little bit, to keep track of all these mins and maxes. Uh, to really, you just need extra bits to label them as mins or maxes. Um, or you, need to you can collect them. Yeah, how do you implement it? Is, is, we didn't discuss exactly how you'd implement it. You can collect these means and maxes into, into arrays, make an array of greens, an array of blues, and yeah, you can do that. Or, what if you didn't want to use the extra space? <laughs> so now we're into the weeds of implementation. And I'm glad you said that, because even that's not obvious, because obviously, you know, we're talking about it. Yeah, you can reshuffle them in the array, or even more simply than that, probably, when you have a pair right here, and let's say this compares less than that, you leave them alone. If this compares less than that, flip them. Okay, so you can do it in situ in place. So flip the pairs in such a way that the min always precedes the max after each comparison. And now, when you need to find the mean, just find the mean of the mean of all the odd ones and the max of all the even ones, because the, all the all the odd ones will be the mins and all the even ones will be the maxes. So that's a good question. So yes, you can do it without extra space, but you are flipping things around. And if you want to flip it back to the original, you, now you have to worry about that. But it may not be necessary. That's a good question. Glad you asked it. How do you understand this discussion right here? Yeah, he's basically asking how do you do this in situ, in place, without extra space. Or at least that's what I morphed this question to be. But you know, he's saying you may need extra space, and you have to worry about that. That's another degree of optimization. So now it's optimal three different ways. Because of his good question, he pointed out that now we know it's optimal three different ways in terms of Linear time, minimum number of comparisons, and a best possible extra space. Constant, or zero more precisely. So it's optimal not just twice, but three times, three different ways. So it's really a good day for algorithmic design. Any other questions or comments? Very good. Why isn't the time complexity n long n? Yeah, because you're comparing everything in pairs. So that's an n over two comparison. And then, out of all the ones that that, lo that lost the comparisons, you're just executing 
the previous algorithm is going over all of them, finding the, mini, the minimum the hard way from the three slides ago. You're not executing this recursively. That's why. Once you have this list of blues and list of greens, with each list, you're just doing that from three slides ago. And that just takes linear comparison in linear time. Once you have this list, you're just doing it in brute force, just like that. One pass. No recursion. In fact, there's no recursion anywhere here. That's why it's not n log n or anything more than linear. Yeah. Even recursively, it's still in the same time, because it's like building a square reach each time you build it. <laughs> yes, I'm proud of you for saying that. Uh, he's saying even if it was recursive, even if you were even if you were recursing this scheme on this guy and then doing comparisons on those pairwise and, and on and on and on and building this tree here, the total time will still be linear. How many understand that? Because it'll be n over 2 plus n over 4 plus n over 8 plus n over 16 and it, it, the sum converges to 2n. Right. Very good. So either way, you'll be fine. But you don't even have to go through all that complexity of recursion. You can just make a single pass through them, and you'll know the answer. Good. I'm glad you asked these smart questions and giving smart answers. All right. Any any other thoughts or comments? All right. So we're now into the lower bound. So this is a generalization of the proof from before, except that instead of two categories, we have four categories. We're going to have items that are not tested, nothing is known about them. We have items that in green that only one against other items in terms of comparisons. Everything is unique. We have items that only lost. Those will be noted in blue. And then items that both won and lost in different comparisons against other things. So here we have only winners, here we have only losers, and here we have winners and losers because sometimes they won, sometimes they lost at different times and different comparisons. All right, so here's the flow of elements. Now it gets a little more dicey than before. Before, everything just flowed from the first to the second. Now there's four things. So if you didn't test any, a pair of elements yet, and you just tested them, one, you can put them in the green category because they just won against something else but didn't lose against anything else, so it goes into the green. One goes into the blue because it only lost but didn't win. So if it only won, you know it's not the min. If it only lost, you know it's not the max. And from the first uh, group, you can only go into the second or third group, but not the fourth right away. If only you're only taking elements from the first, from the first group. If you take elements from ele elements from this group and this group, if one has before won against something and now it loses against something, then it goes into the red, okay? And if you take something that only won and uh, compare it to something that only lost and this still wins and this still loses, it, it, those two remain where they are. How do you see what's going on? Good. It's a generalization of what we did a couple of slides ago with the simpler lower bound, because now we're doing both min and the max. So the initial state, and things were not tested, we don't know anything about them, and nothing lost, nothing won, and nothing won and lost, because nothing yet happened, the algorithm didn't run. Which algorithm? Any algorithm. Okay. And at the end, we're going to have nothing that's never been tested, because everything's got to be tested at least once. We already know that from six or seven slides ago. Right. One item is only one against other things. One item is only lost against everything. And n minus two items both lost and won against other things. And so this category here that only won against some stuff must be the max. And this guy that only lost against everything else must be the min. And that represents a state of knowledge in any algorithm that uses comparisons to try to find the min and the max. So there will be the min and there will be the max. This isn't an algorithm. This is the encapsulation or the representation of the state of knowledge gained by any algorithm that would run to try to do this job of finding the min and the max. So, all right, 
So now we can start keeping track and tracking how things flow among these sets. Right? So if you have something from the unknown, I'm color coding everything. So uh, this set here, something compared to something else, and in, the, in a test like this, means this first thing goes into the blue set, that second thing goes into the green set. Because this second thing won, so it goes into the green set of things that only won. This first thing lost, then it goes into the blue set of things that only lost. So two things coming from the first set go into the second and third set like this, respectively. How many understand this notation? Okay. And then we keep track of all the other possibilities. Right? So this guy goes to here, this guy goes to there, and that's, that's how it flows. And by the way, if it was the opposite comparison, if this guy was greater than this guy, then it would flow slightly differently. Then the first guy would go into the green, and the second guy would go into the blue, you know, as opposed to the other way around. So here I'm going to track comparison, and here the negation of this comparison, compare the other way. Okay. What if one came from the first, and the second came from the second? That you'll compare, and they compare like this. Then the first will go into the blue, the second will remain in the green because this one came from the green, it won before, and now it won again, so it stays in the green, the second element, and so on. If you compare the other way, so if you compare it the other way, if this first element was greater than that, it goes into the green, this uh, element goes into the green, but the element that won and now lost goes into the red because it both lost and won, so it goes this way. Right? How, many, how many get that so far? Okay, so without belaboring all the points, and all the cases, let's just show you all the other cases. And we're not going to waste time here going through each and every one, because there's a bunch. But the point is that once you examine all the possibilities of where an element can come from, and where the other element can come from, and if one is less than the other, one is greater than the other, where they started from, where they end up, you can make certain observations. And the observations is that the minimum knowledge gained you know, moves towards the final states. Yeah, so if two things came from the first, you get two bits of knowledge. In other words, you make two, two sets of progress or two points of progress. One will end up here and one will end up there. Okay? Not just one of them will move, but both of them will move out to the green and the blue if they start here in the, in the first set. Okay? And you can similarly track how many bits of progress will be made if all these other cases happen. And sometimes it's no progress at all. And these are unnecessary comparisons. So, you know, if something, if both things came from the red set, both have won or lost, you already know that neither one is the min, because they both, both, each one lost and each one won in different comparisons. So neither one could be the min or the max. But we can, nothing stops you from wanting to compare them. It's like nothing stops you from playing chess while you're adding the numbers together. And so the total progress of such a comparison will be zero. Okay. And that's not going to hurt the lower bound, because you can make as many as you want. But things that do make progress are the ones that count, like the first one or the second one, and that kind of thing. And once you make these observations, you can quantitatively say that moving from the first set to the final and red set forces passing through the two intermediary sets, one or the other. In other words, any element that goes from the first set to the fourth set, from the black set to the red set, has to pass through the two green or blue sets. There's no direct path from the black to the red, using a single comparison, using two elements that only came from the black set from the first set. Right? So there's no direct, you know, uh, expressway from the first to the last. You have to go through the two intermediary ones. Okay. How do you understand that? Okay. Simply because you take any two things from the first, because you go to the second, the third, not the fourth, immediately. Other things can get you to the fourth, but not if both came from the first. So, so emptying the first Emptying the, remember the initial state, the initial state is all of them are in this first set. 
and the final state of any algorithm is that, that that set is empty. And it takes n over two comparisons at least to empty out the first set into the next two. Right? And that's that second observation here that I'm making on this slide here. At least n over two are necessary to empty out the first set. And then emptying most of the second set takes n over two because at the end, there will only be one remaining here and one remaining here, and the n minus 2 will remain there, will end up in this last set. Because neither will be the min, neither will be the max. There's only a unique min and a unique max. Again, uniqueness here helps us. We don't have to worry about the quality in other cases. So uh, roughly n over 2 to empty the first, n over 2 to almost empty the second, n over 2 to almost empty the third. It's really n over 2 minus 1, because 1 will remain. Other moves could be made, but they're not going to make you any more useful progress. Then this is the minimum move necessary to pro progress towards the final state of knowledge, where one is the min minus the max, and the other n minus two we know is neither the min, but neither the max. Yeah. Uh, so you emptying most of the green and the blue sets yeah. are like a core part of the algorithm, but you counted moving it into the red set as no knowledge gain? I mean, maybe that's not important, but what's the intuition behind, like you said, when you move something from the green or the blue set into the red set, you counted it as zero knowledge gain, but like, that's, that's oh, kind of the point. Well, it's it's not zero knowledge. When you say emptying the, the, uh, the, emptying the, uh, the green or emptying the blue, whenever something moves out of the green or out of the blue, it can only end up in the red. The red is where they're going, where they're being emptied into. But isn't that like you're gaining some knowledge that that one is not the min or the max? Yeah. So it's yeah, and I'm counting it here by by having it leave the green. So I'm I'm, I'm counting that as a step. When it exits the green, that's a bit of knowledge gain. Yeah, and when it exits the blue, bit of knowledge gain. But to answer your point, where are they going when they're leaving the green or the red? They're going into the green or the blue, they're going into the red by leaving the green. There's only one path from the green and one path out of the blue, and they both point towards the red. So when I say leave the green, they're going to the red, and I'm counting that. So, so I am counting those red involved motions or movements of elements. But I'm counting them here and here. On the third and fourth bullet, uh, the word most is used. So it is most all but one? Yes. When when I say most, I mean all but one. Okay, that's important. So the motion is pairs from here will end up both in the green and the blue, both places. So a pair from the from the from the first set will end up in the second and third. And then eventually, not necessarily right now, but eventually, both of those will migrate to the red, to that last set. That can happen, you know, at some point in the execution. But the algorithm is not going to finish until all that happens. Because at the end, only one thing must be identified as the min, one thing must be identified as the max, and these are these two middle sets. And the rest are either implicitly or explicitly known to be not the min and not the max, and only then can the algorithm terminate with the correct answer. Which algorithm? Any algorithm. Now you're getting it. How many are sort of seeing what's going on? Not necessarily everything, but I'm kind of grokking the, the gist of this. Uh, where's the word grok come from, by the way? See if you have a classical literary education, which we hope you do here at UVA. That's what we aim to give you. Anyway, extra credit. What's the word grok? Which famous novel it comes from? Um, I'll give you a hint at science fiction. Um, Okay, so any other moves will not get you the final state any faster. For example, you can take two things from the red, compare them, and then they'll obviously both still remain in the red, but you could, nothing stops you from doing that. But that's not going to get you any faster to, uh, to, 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 to an answer or a solution when you run an algorithm, any algorithm. All right, so the total number of comparisons required to get you from an initial state to a final state, no matter what algorithm is running, is the sum total of these three quantities, which is 3n over 2 minus 2. And amazingly enough, you know, that, that algorithm from a couple of slides ago did meet that uh, necessary lower bound, 
with an upper bound by virtue of being a correct algorithm. So that algorithm is optimal in the number of comparisons. Not asymptotically, but exactly. Of course, it's, if, it's, if it's optimal exactly, it's also optimal asymptotically. If it's optimal asymptotically, it's not necessarily optimal exactly. So for example, with sorting, we know that n log n are necessary. That's the lower bound for sorting. But we don't know what it is exactly. Maybe it's 2 n log n. Maybe it's 3 n log n. We have some more precise characterizations, but the real answer of exactly how many are necessary in the absolutely minimal, actually, nobody knows. It's an open problem still after you know almost a century of examining sorting in, in great detail and depth. Here, we're giving the exact answers, not just the asymptotics. Yeah? Um, is there a name for this perf technique of making a state machine of like knowledge known? He's asking, is there a name for this proof technique of having a state machine? So it's, it's not quite a state machine in the sense of finite automata, but it is kind of a tracking of states of knowledge, yes. Uh, so first of all, it's a lower bound proof. It's also a proof by contradiction. Any lower bound proof is kind of assumed there was an algorithm that did this faster, then this shows you that it can't be done any faster. So it's, it's an implicit proof by contradiction here. So generally, it's a lower bound proof. Secondly, it's a proof by contradiction. And you can call it proof by tracking the state of knowledge in the execution of any algorithm. I don't, I don't know there's a special name that does uh, describe it more succinctly than that. But yeah, but it is a proof by contradiction. It is uh, uh, a non-existence proof. That's another way to say this. This proof is a non-existence proof. Why? What does not exist that this proves that it doesn't exist? This is a proof that we're not a millionaire. Something doesn't exist. What doesn't exist? Why is this a non-existence proof? Uh, a w an algorithm or a way of reaching the final state. Any yes. Faster. It shows that no algorithm exists that can find the min and the max faster than that in terms of the number of comparisons, the exact number of comparisons. It's a non-existence proof. So yeah, that's, that's a name for it. But it's a bit subtle why it's even a non-existence proof. You have, to, you have to keep in mind all these, all these logical relationships and what we're doing. This is subtle, I agree. Uh, not obvious. And if somebody asks you to prove a lower bound like this, I mean, you know, if you, if you would have come up with this, with this argument, with the four, four buckets and how knowledge moves around and all these arguments and all these special cases that we saw on the previous slide and tracking it. Um, yeah, yeah. We'll be very impressed. Probably give you a PhD on the spot if you can you know, come up with this. You know, the people who first came up with these probably did get PhDs for that. Nowadays, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's half of a lecture in an of course, but you know, 40 or 50 years ago it was a PhD. This kind of, this kind of subtle insight and kind of crisp, you know, <coughs> wrapping of a mind around this uh, kind of notions of lower bounds and non-existence proof of course any one of an infinite number of algorithms that can be the job. That's pretty impressive. It's not, it's not trivial. Any, any more questions or comments about this? So again, lower bound proofs are not easy. And now we've, this is the hardest proof we've seen so far in this course, and that's not the hardest we will see. But so far, this was the least trivial thing we we've seen so far in terms of a proof. Uh, all right, so um, given n integers, find the maximum and the next to the maximum. Remember, we gave this problem as extra credit. How many solved it? How many worked on this, which is really the important part. OK. And the rest, don't care. That's all right. Have fun with programming device writers for IBM for the rest of your life. That's okay. You'll still make six figures, but Google will not be impressed with you. You don't try solving problems. During your interview, they'll give you problems and they'll watch you try to solve them. You just pass them and just wait for answers all throughout. You, know? you can't cram, cram over a weekend for becoming a MacGyver. You know, just stating the obvious. Or Matt Damien on Mars. You know, it doesn't come from a weekend of cramming. Trust me on that. Uh, OK, but uh, find the max and next to max. Um, there's, there's very easy ways of of doing it. Uh, if you want to find the max and next to the max, 
one easy way of doing it is first find the max, then take that away from the set, and then find the max again in the remaining elements. And now you have the max next to max. How many get that? That's an algorithm. How many comparisons is that from? Find the max, then take that away and find the max on the remaining element. So now you got both. 2n minus 3. 2n minus 3, correct. How many see that? 2n minus 3. Good. Obviously, that's not the best we can do. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here bothering you with this problem somewhere. Right? So we're going to do better. Instead of 2n minus 3, we're going to show you can do it in n minus 2 plus log n. So we're going to do it using a tournament argument. Right? Let's say you're know, playing tennis. And you play tennis, and you know, you're playing pairs, or, and then the winners of those pairwise tennis matches play each other, and eventually, at the end, one victor, you know, victor uh, uh, comes out, you know, victorious across the entire set. So you play in pairs, you take the max of pairs, and then you take the max of those maxes, right? And the tournament proceeds, and eventually, in the quarterfinals, semifinals, finals, and the finals. And at the end, there's one winner overall that's the best player you know, among the entire set. And there it is. And so it's, we're doing that recursively, what we said earlier, um, keep finding the max, the maxes. And that's how a tournament works. Right? It, it doesn't have to be tennis. It could be any sport, obviously. You know, football, any, any sport, you know, the Olympic swimming or whatever. OK. So uh, the total number of comparisons here is n minus 1. How many can see that? Because what you said earlier, the tree you know, converges to, to a linear amount. You know, n over 2 plus n over 4 plus n, and so on, converges to n minus 1. Okay, so now I'm going to present this tree kind of diagrammatically as this triangle representing this whole tree. And let's say that somewhere in the bottom, uh, again, they're all unique, so we don't have to worry about the clouds or ties. Everything is, is unique. So there's always winners and losers who never ties. Uh, so the next to the maximum must have started somewhere at the bottom of the tree, just like everything else started at the bottom of the tree and rose, tried to rise its way to the top. Okay. So the next to the maximum, if you have a bunch of players, say tennis, the second best player in the world, there's only one player, that second best player could have lost to if they're second best, they're going to win against everybody except the world champion. Right? How do you get that? Obviously, they're all unique. So the second to maximum, the second to best player started at the bottom and made its way, or at least tried to make its way to the top, and at some point was thwarted and didn't get to the top because the winner, the overall champion, went to the top. And the overall, overall champion is the only player that could have beat this guy. So in the final tree, where will this guy end up as they keep playing and playing and playing until there's one winner, one winner emerging? It's one of the ones that the winner won against. Yeah. It's not right next to the root. How I many can see that? It's not right next to the root. Why? Why isn't it like right there, right next to the root? Yeah, this guy could have been eliminated right off the bat by chance by playing the true champion and would have lost right on the first tournament, never mind three or four iterations later. They could have won, could have lost right away. Because the, the true champion would be right next to them, playing them on the very first round, and they would never get any higher than the first level. That wouldn't make for great television drama. Ideally, you want like you know. The, so so when when they, when they when they actually pair up players in the actual tournament, whether it's tennis or you know, fencing or whatever Olympic sport or sorry, a sport you want, they don't they don't pit the best players against each other right away. Why? Because they will be eliminated. You know, many, most of the best players best players will be eliminated right away. And for the rest of the tournament, all you'll see is mediocre players and and the champion. So it wouldn't be very interesting. So you want to kind of mix and match them so that the best players will survive, survive, and then eliminate each other. And towards the end, you'll have only good players 
and then those would be eliminated, and finally one champion will barely beat the next guy that's second best, and then that makes for a very nice drama and television and reporting and excitement and fun to watch, right? Uh, and movies are that way too, right? When you have a movie like John Wick, or you know, there's all these firefights, you know, whatever. You know, you don't want you, know, you want the two really good people, usually the good guy and the bad guy, to last to the very end. You know, you don't want John Wick to eliminate. You know, the arch enemy that's almost as good as him, like in the first two minutes of the movie, and for the rest of the movie, he's just beating everybody else up, mopping the floor, and you know, without any effort. That's not very good at the yeah. Think about it. So, but anyway, the point is, this guy could have been eliminated right away, but he could have been eliminated as the winner rose up. The second to next winner would have been beaten by the winner on the path the winner took to the top, and it could have been any one of those on the path to the top. The second to best player. It doesn't have to be way at the bottom, it doesn't have to be way at the top, it could be anywhere near the path. But how long is this path? Because this is a binary tree. They're pairwise. So how long is this path if there's n players? Log n. Question. Oh yeah, so when you said to get the first maximum number, you you did like n minus one comparison. Uh is isn't that the Best case scenario because if I take six players, then I'll have six comparisons to get the first maximum number. <coughs> well, so there's n players, so the first level will have n over two comparisons. Let us take six players. Why, why even bother ourselves with n players? Let us say six players. Well, then let's make it a power of two, so so it, so so it works out more nicely. Okay. Yeah. So make it a power of two, and then. If it's not a power of two, you can pad it out, you know, to make it the next power of two, and, and then you'll get very similar results. But let's not worry about these kind of cases, right? Let's make it a power of two. So when you say log, you know, the, the answer is a whole number. Because yeah. it's log base two. Yeah, I took this case because I was struggling with six. And oh, okay. So make it that, eight. That is why. Yeah, maybe good maybe point. So that's right. And that, that's a good insight. But I would say make it eight. See, it works with 8 or 16 or 32. And then if it's not a power of 2, add a few more that are non-players. That would lose to anybody. So they're just, they're just padding out the crowd to make it the next power of 2, and then it would be these numbers. OK, good, good point. Any other thoughts or questions? All right. So, so first you do n minus 1 comparison, and then you compare all these log n to each other the hard way using the, the you know the, the naive algorithm from you know, ten slides ago, um, and that's log n minus one comparisons, just straightforwardly comparing them all, finding the maximum of all of those other than the true uh, champion, and so the sum total is n minus two plus you know log n uh, total unnecessary, um, you know for uh, finding the maximum and x to maximum. So so this proof. It, is, is, is an algorithm, so that's sufficient. It turns out separately that it's also necessary. We haven't proved that it's necessary. We showed that it's efficient by giving the algorithm. The algorithm is right there. Of course, you know, if you had to write it with pseudocode or code it up, you could convert this to an algorithm pretty, pretty straightforwardly. How many can see how converting it to code would, would work pretty straightforwardly? Not, not a big deal. But the idea is not the code. The idea is that the champion could have only beaten uh, the the next the, the next two best the next best from the champ can only have been lost to the champion. And there's only log n possibilities there in this tournament style elimination, and that's how you find it very quickly without too many comparisons. Now the the naive method that we just said find the max in the previous slide the naive method finding the max and next to max is find the max eliminate it then from the remaining one find the next to max again using the brute force naive linear scan. And that was 2n, 2n minus 3. This is n minus 2 plus log n, so it's almost twice as good, a factor of almost 2, better than, than 2n. So it's quite a bit of savings here, not just a quarter, but almost 50% savings. Because log n is much, much smaller than n. Right. Now, separately, you can prove, or it has been proven, that n minus 2 plus log n are also necessary, not just sufficient. In other words, it's also a lower bound. The exact lower bound on any algorithm finds the min, the min, the max, and next to max. 
That's not easy to prove, and we won't do it here. But for extra credit, try to prove that too. Any question? Yeah. Yeah, just a question. These uh, the number of uh, comparisons that we are trying to find out. We are trying to find out when we are using comparison to find the maximum minimum, right? Yeah, we're using comparisons, so we're counting comparisons. So either you know, two things is one less than the other, one bigger than the other. We have to worry about equality because everything is unique without also generality. You can break ties based on the indices, the array where these are just there. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions? Because now we're going to go deeper into. Selection. So what we've doing, been doing so far is selection today. We selected the largest, the smallest, the largest and the smallest, the largest and the next the largest. Right? These are called order, order statistics, statistics about order. Largest, smallest, next to largest, third largest. Now we're going to go full out and find the ith largest for any i. And this generalizes everything we've done up to now today. We're going to find the ith largest for any i. And now things will get even more esoteric. Okay, so first, we observe that finding the ice largest can be done by successive application of finding the median. The median is the n over 2 largest. It's the line in the middle. Assuming n is odd in this case. So the line in the middle is very specific, very unique. They're all different from one another. They're all unique. How do you reduce finding the ice largest to just repeatedly finding the median? Okay. Uh, not that hard to see. Let's say you have 100 things and you want to find the ice largest. The median is the middle one, assuming it's, uh, you know, the median is right there. And, you know, assuming there's an odd number of them, the median is one of those. Or, you know, in particular, the median of an even number of things is maybe the average of the middle two, or either one of the middle two. Anyway, any way to find it is all equivalent. So, if you want to find the 87th largest, say, in a group of 100 things, and you know what the median is, all you got to do is take everything larger than the median, and among those, find the 37th largest, because 37 plus 50 is 87, or 87 minus 37 is 50, and 50 is the median. So if you want to find the 87th largest of a group of 100, it suffices to find the 37th largest in the upper group of 50 of those. All the 50 that are larger than the median. How many get that? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward, right? And now you still want to find the 37th largest in this group of 50. So what do you do now? One word. Recurse. Or iterate. They're really equivalent. The compiler always converts recursion into iteration. How many understand that? When you say recursive, so the compiler for the machine, for the hardware, it doesn't really mean recursive. It means iterative. But anyway, um, and now you want to find the median of this group of 50 and see how it, this item 37th compares to the median. It'll be, the median will be the 25th element of this 50. So it's 25, and now you'll find the 37 minus 25, which is 12. You want to find the 12th item in the upper group of these 25. How many get that? And you just keep going. How many calls to the median did you do overall? How many repeated calls to the median subroutine did you do overall to find this i's largest? Long. Long. Logarithmic number. How many see that? Because the space is divided by factor of two every time. It's half as large each iteration. So before you know it, you only have one thing and that there's your answer. And if the median subroutine worked in linear time, we're not saying how, because that's a huge tricky question to begin with, and we'll do that, but we'll do that next time. If the median subroutine worked in linear time and you made logarithmic number of calls to it with smaller and smaller inputs, what's the total amount of time you're expending? is a function of n. Big O of n, how many can see that? Because first you call it an n things. That's linear in n. Then you call it n over two things. Because you want to find the median of the upper 50. Then you call it n over four things. So the total time is linear in n, then plus linear in n over two, plus linear in n over four, which is plus n over four, plus n over two, back to linear. The total will be 2n. How many see this thing converges to linear? So you make log 
logarithmic number of calls to the median subroutine with smaller and smaller by half inputs, and the total number, number of time, the total time expended in total will still be linear. Which means if we have a linear time algorithm for the median, this scheme, this set of observations, gives us a linear time algorithm for any i is largest for any i not just for i is equal to n over 2, which is the median, but for any arbitrary i. That will work in linear time, too. How many see that? So you can do i selection in linear time, assuming you can do i selection for the median. So now it all depends on being able to do i selection in, in linear time for the median, which is what we'll do next time. But that's why we're after the median in linear time now, because that will give us any i selection in median time as well. Solving the median is as general as solving the arbitrary i smallest or i largest, not just i is equal to n over 2, which is the median. So we reduce the problem of finding the i largest in the same time, linear, to the problem of finding the median. But it's got to be worst case linear time, not average case. And next time, we'll do that. Um, so, uh, Maybe in the interest of stopping on time, we'll stop here. Any questions about any of this? How many are working in groups? Good. The rest of you do that, too. Um, how was the pizza on Monday? Good. How many were there on Monday out of curiosity? A bunch of Okay, that's good. A couple of dozen. All right. All right. See you next time. <laughs> So that's that's okay. That, that's the spirit of the tool to reduce the amount of like, crazy timing that something like that. Oh no, not this So there's yeah, there's a project in the project. Uh, you can come up with something interesting and run it by me, and I'll say it's okay, or I'll say it's too difficult, or it's too easy. Uh, and you can work on groups of uh, Not groups of 17. Uh, I'd rather it be two. Uh, unless you do something really ambitious, quite. Like, what do you get a lot? 
If you ask me during class, I will, I will talk about it. Uh, and uh, I mentioned it during the first day, but you know, speak to all. If you ask me during class, I will, I will say more about it. But it's some programming of some algorithms, you know, and there's a lot of leeway in what you can do and what you choose to do. There's some interesting algorithmic stuff that you always want to do, and then an opportunity, and it's not going to get hurt. I thought it was about 30%. Uh, yeah, on the first few slides is the percentages. I think I said 30%. Well, so it's, it's a big chunk of the grade. But if you start on early, you know, it's it pretty easy to finish. Right? You, you said it's the last weekend, it won't be easy. So don't do that. All right. So you know what you want. This can never be the maximum if it, it was not compared to second to the maximum. Uh, it must have met the second to the maximum. Yes, so now here we had n things, here we had n by two things, and kind of keep scoring the maximum. Okay, so that is the number of comparisons that happen with n were like long. That was a number of comparisons. Out of those comparisons, one of them had to be the second the second aspect. So now you have an array of log base two n elements out of which you want to find the maximum, which would be the next maximum. And again, it works with the same thing that you need minimum and maximum one comparison. Just that n here was. So to find the maximum, we needed one minus n. And to find the second maximum, uh, you can start any time you want. And that's how it becomes Just, uh, minus two plus you know, okay. Let me know what yeah. what you I mean, propose you to do. The n minus one you would have done if you don't have to wait. After that, you start uh, looking for the second maximum. And that's what that you are working by yourself. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it, right? Uh, okay. That's what we're so so trying to do. On the project, you can you can do the project with one other person. What we do? What we do is we can try to put numbers and we verify it. That's how we were like, okay, this was. Where I got confused is that I thought this count we are doing it here. We are doing it here, but this we are doing it for maximum. Yeah, either email or ask. Yeah, they have a smaller class set class now, class only the numbers which were already compared to maximum. That's the so set for example, we are trying to find the second, second maximum. Yeah, and this minus one, one is because the, so the final thing is you this don't need the comparison. Yeah, uh, the yeah, final comparison. You reach the bottom, you reach one. You have a lot of leeway. Let me go down. Thank you. Thank you. sorting algorithms and compare them side by side, count number of comparisons and put more inputs, graph it and draw some conclusions and maybe tweak the sorting algorithms so that they're a little bit more optimal and you know, now that does sound more like an interesting project. You know, that, that's a lot 
less obvious than just a generic, you know, merge sort or whatever. And the outcome is not necessarily very predictable. You know, try to, to, you know, run, if you run it on, in a lot of test cases, 10 items, 100 items, 1,000 items, 10,000 items, a million, 10 million, 100 million, a billion items, start plotting the, the actual runtime or the number of comparisons and compare them to these other methods and the same inputs and use a different inputs like you know, near sorted inputs, sorted inputs, random inputs, inputs with a lot of duplicates. And, and now you can begin to draw interesting conclusions. Now it sounds a lot more like a research project or, or something that's interesting that not everybody has always done quite like that. And you can plot the graphs and you know, it's not obvious which will have the least number of comparisons for a hundred items or a thousand items. Sometimes they will flip, you know. So, when, so now you're getting into more interesting territory. And it's still about sorting. So make out the all different kind of samples and analyze uh, what the performance of every yes. sorting. Just just like we did in that graphic that I showed you, where all of them compete against each other, you know, like all the sorting algorithms by all the different data sets, and they're all maybe even have a visual user interface like we saw on that slide. No, no slide I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. Even with the sound, well, it was kind of similar. So if you, if you go over the project that basically shows me on the, show, shows this to me on the user interface, that's pretty impressive. And not just that, but you know, then create all sorts of graphs comparing the number of uh, runtimes and comparisons, and, and and let the user choose the number of items, not just have a fixed you know fifty items or whatever. And, and uh, yeah, that 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 uh, now it's it's a lot more interesting, and and now. It, it's more respectable as a project for a graduate course or semesters worth of work and that kind of thing. It's not just pen line subroutine. You know, okay. it's, just a, it's just a simple exercise in five minutes. That will be impressive. Okay. And it will teach you more about all those methods. And it'll be interesting to see, you play with, you can make an app for it, put it on the web. Maybe it'll go viral. You don't you never have to work again. You know? So who knows? Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, question regarding the lower bound. Mm -hmm. So regarding that lower bound, that to find the minimum, like minimum or the maximum, we need minimum n by two comparisons. That's not complete. When we, oh, let's say we have the dollar one lower bound for the car, but that's still not a complete lower bound. So when we are trying to define lower bounds, do we want them to be complete? Well, what do you mean complete? Like we can never get a car for one. So I mean, it is a lower bound. I mean, two is a better lower bound, but yes, one is definitely not a complete lower bound if we never can get a car for. Well, it is a lower bound. Correct, correct. No, that's what my question is. So when we're trying to define lower bounds, do we want to make sure that it solves the problem completely? Uh, no, no. no? Okay. So, so like I said about the example with the car, at one dollar is a lower bound on the price of a car. Yes, correct. It doesn't mean you can get a car for a dollar. You can't. Okay. So I mean that's fine. So, but but it's still a true statement that one is a lower bound on the price of a car. And similarly for the upper bounds, we can like if this like linear is the upper bound for something, we can always say n squared is also an upper bound. For yes, that. absolutely. Yeah. But it, because, but in the case of upper bounds, we do find a final answer in n squared for sure. But in the case of lower bounds, we do not find a like final answer. Well, you may or may not be able to, and maybe you can't so far, but one day you will. But but it's still a lower bound right now. Oh, that way. So, but my point is like if we prove like non-existence theorems like. 3n by 2 minus 2 is the absolute minimum that you need to do, and you can not. Yes, but, but that doesn't mean that n is not a lower bound also. n is also a lower bound, and so is n over 2. And 3 halves n minus 2, that's also a lower bound, and that's a better lower bound because it's bigger than the other lower bound. Okay. So, so, so it's like saying, you know, a billion dollars is an upper bound on the price of a, of a house. Okay. I mean, it doesn't take a billion dollars to buy a house. You can get yes. one for only a million or actually a lot less. But, but in but that that's case, still, that's still a true statement. But in that case, in billion, you hundred percent get a house. But now we say like dollar one is a lower bound on a house. That means you, that means at least a dollar will be required be to get a house. You right? might not be able to get it. Okay. I mean, yeah, probably it's just like the way how you construct the statement probably kind of gives more detail. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what I was thinking when I, I thought about lower bounds. I thought lower bound would be something that is lower, but also. 
hundred percent solves the algorithm, like solves the problem right now. Yeah. So so it doesn't have to do the latter part. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So lower bound is something from below that is a, a floor, you know, is a, is is less than any algorithm that actually solves the problem, less than or equal to, let's say, okay. you know, any algorithm that solves the problem. Mm -hmm. An upper bound is greater than uh, some algorithm that solves the problem, okay. not all of them. Okay. Yeah. Some could take arbitrary amounts of time okay. to start okay. playing chess, okay. even okay. addition will take forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so the lower bound has to apply to all algorithms. The upper bound has to apply to at least one. one. Okay. That makes more sense. And I, I think like in the yeah. lower bound, if it does everything completely and it's lower than, or let's say higher than, no, if it's lower than something else, then we have found a better algorithm. Well, but the lower bound has to be less than any algorithm, not just a okay, okay. Yeah. Let's say the previous defined, like in yeah. case of 3n by 2 minus 2, let's say that's the established minimum yeah. number set. If we find the lower bound of n by 2 and it also solves the problem completely, then we have achieved well, when you say it, some algorithm solves the problem, but separately there's a lower bound on any algorithm that solves the problem. Correct, correct. That algorithm that solves the problem will never run in faster time than that lower bound, because the lower bound applies to the problem, not to so, the algorithm yeah, yeah. that solves the problem. Um, yeah, that was my point. Like, if you try, if you can run it smaller than and still finish the problem, that's when you make the discovery. <laughs> yeah. So, so, in fact, there are problems <coughs> for which there is no sharp lower bound. No, yeah. So when you say complete, you really mean Mm -hmm. sharp. It, yeah. means, it means exactly meets the bound of some algorithm, the upper bound of some algorithm, and then it's a sharp bound because it's above and from below the exact same bound. Okay. So it's sandwiched from above and below and then two It's like a tight bound. Tight bound. Okay. So when you say complete, I, I assume you mean tight bound. Right? So for sorting, there's a, a, a merge sort is a tight algorithm for, for sorting because the upper bound of n log n right of merge, merge sort meets the lower bound of n log n for general sorting. So it's a complete or tight bound. Mm -hmm. And that means that you cannot, you know, so that asymptotically uh, merge short is up in the worst case. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but it turns out that there's problems for which there is no optimal algorithm mm -hmm. uh, on several counts. One, one case that's more uh, common is there's no, there are problems for which there's no uh, known um, uh, algorithm f that, that is, is, is tight. It's sharp. Or it's tight. sharp. Okay. The, well, the best we can do so far is this, yes. and this still doesn't meet the lower bound, or the best known lower bound, mm -hmm. and it's not sharp. So, I mean, but it's not sharp as far as we know. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it may be sharp when one day somebody can prove a higher lower, lower bound, bound, and then yes. all of a sudden <clears> that <throat> algorithm has been known for a long time becomes sharp. Yeah. Uh, but we don't know that it's not sharp right now. And there's even a more subtle case that's more uh, complicated. That there are problems, you can prove that there are problems for which there is no sharp algorithm in existence. There are plenty of algorithms that solve the problem, but none of them are sharp. Oh. Uh, that's a much more subtle statement that has to do with complexity. Um, but in that case, we'll have to prove that lower bound and the upper bound don't meet, and the lower bound is not able to solve the problem. When I say complete, I, what I mean is like, if you're doing sorting, you, yeah. should, like, you should have a sorted array at the end. After the even after just doing the lower bound number, so yes. that's what I meant by complete. Yeah. So I mean, in that case, what it means is like you've proven a lower bound, but you've not come up with an algorithm of, for that lower bound. That's right. And there's plenty of problems in that okay. category. Okay. Uh, sorting is not one of them. Like formats, probably. Might be so. so like all those like problems which are like open. Oh no no no, no 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 not even those. Uh, minimal spanning trees, for example, is in that category. Okay. We know that linear is a lower bound. And we have algorithms that can do it in almost linear time. Okay, but not. But it's not sharp. But like you can always come up with slightly less linear, like slightly lesser constant than that or something. Uh, like no, that. it's not about constants. It's about just, asymptotics. Just, oh, okay. Asymptotically, it's not sharp. The algorithm is basically not just less than n log n. It's less than n log log n. It's, it's less than n log 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 n. It's basically mm -hmm. n log star. Yeah. Log star is how many times oh, you yes. take the log before it goes to, to zero. Okay. And there's, there's minimum spanning tree algorithms that are like basically n log star, essentially, mm -hmm. number of comparisons. But the best lower bound we have is still linear. Okay. And there's a gap there, a symptotic gap. Mm -hmm. And we don't know if it closes on, on linear 
or if the linear lower bound will eventually rise to that. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. So how did we come up with the lower bound it in that case? It could be both. How, come, how did we come up with the lower bound in such a case? Like, if we could not see an algorithm, but... Like, I mean, I, I know it's low, possible. Low, it could be possible. Lower bounds don't depend on algorithms. Yeah, yeah. I mean... But they only depend on the problem. Yes, but th what we are saying is this is the minimum number of steps required to solve the problem. That's a, That would be a lower bound. That would be a lower yeah. bound. But we are, we are just not sure what...